start record before I forget. So as I was saying, this is really our second week of the NSS because we started last week with revision when we started going through the 2023 exam paper. And there are just two questions left in the paper, so hopefully we'll be able to finish both of those this evening, or at least have a look at them. The last one, question five, is a very long question, so I won't go through every single workings in that, but that one um, is obviously just to show you the layout of the answer, etc. So let me see. Yes, it doesn't look like anyone else is joining us. So I'm going to share my screen and then um, we'll be able to all see the exam paper. So just give me a sec while I go over to share. Share audio. All right, so now, there we go. You should now be able to see the screen. So I'm going to go straight over to the paper. So this is question four. So up until uh, last week, we did question one, two, and three. So if you weren't online last week or you haven't listened to that recording yet, that has been recorded. I've uploaded it to your announcements on Learn, and it's also been uploaded to your YouTube um, playlist. And last week we did question one, which was um, calculating a future value using tables. Then we also did question two, which was our valuation of uh, business. So we calculated, what did they call it? Sorry, capital, capital project. So we used the calculating the payback period and the annualized net present value for two different projects. That's quite a nice question. And then the third question was on bond valuation questions. I think that's learning unit five. So this evening, we're going to start with question four, which is on share valuation. And sorry, I've got the wrong learning unit. That's bond valuation is, let me look in the index, I get it right. Bond valuation is LU4. And share valuations is LU5. So this is going to be an LU5 question tonight on share valuations. And remember, in the share valuation chapter LU5, we have got um, how many different methods? Let me just go and check again. We've got the dividend growth model, which includes the constant growth and the variable growth models. Then we've got the free cash flow valuation model the price earnings valuation model, and then also book valuation and liquidation value. So in that chapter, there are quite a few different valuation methods that they that you have to study. And obviously in the exam, they can't test us on all of them. So in this particular paper, if you go down here and have a look at the required for question four, they want us to calculate the initial list price per share using the free cash flow model. And that is going to be for 27 marks. So let's have a look at what the question, what information the question presents to us. Just hold on a sec. I just need to connect this light because the light does start fading still at this time of the evening. That's better. So by the time I finish talking to you, then it's, I can't see my screen that well. Okay, so info that we've been given, we wish to value the shares of Legend PTY Limited, which is an unlisted company. So that's an important piece of information because if you read through that free cash flow valuation information, you'll see that that is specifically a method that we use where we are trying to value shares of a company that are unlisted. Because obviously a listed company, it's easier to get a valuation or fix on what the value per share is because we've got a traded market value on the stock exchange. So we can easily track what the latest price per share is, and then also do our own valuations, but we've got a benchmark. When we've got an unlisted company, there's no market price for our shares to use as a benchmark. So this company is considering becoming listed on the JSE, and we've been requested to determine what the initial list price should be. 
So I don't know if you've heard of the term IPO, initial. Do you remember? Do you have you heard of IPO? Whoopsie Daisy, I need dropped something. Um, which is the initial offering, in other words, the very first time that a share is offered on the market for sale when the company launches its shares on whichever stock exchange they're launching on. We have to do some kind of evaluation exercise so that when we launch these shares for the first time, we can give the investors an indication of what price we want the shares to be sold at when we launch them for the first time, because there'll be no market price to refer to. So this is obviously the way that the company is going to raise share capital by launching these shares on the stock exchange. They'll sell all these shares and then raise um, a whole bunch of ordinary share capital. The company's other sources of capital are corporate bonds with a market value of 16 million 150. So we know that bonds are considered to be debt because when we issue bonds, it's the same thing as selling debt into the marketplace. So the company raised funding to the tune of 16 million by selling corporate bonds. And then they have also in the past sold preference shares with a market value of 9.750 million. So preference shares, although they've got the word shares in the name, they are not 100% equity, as in ordinary share capital. They're not the ordinary share capital holders. Preference shares is a, like a hybrid instrument that has got some aspects of debt to it, because usually the return for the holders of the preference shares is fixed, because we'll say these are 10% preference shares, or these are 8% preference shares, meaning that the company will pay that fixed return of 8% or 10% to the holders of the preference shares while, they, while they're holding on to those shares. So that is, um, it does have uh, a strong characteristics of debt, um, but as well as um, equity as well, because preference shares can also possibly be converted into ordinary shares at some later stage. But for, the, for these purposes, we are going to treat the corporate bonds and the preference shares as if that was debt. Okay, so these are other sources of capital. So the previous sources of capital that the company has used to raise funds, to raise capital funds, was corporate bonds and preference shares. The company's weighted average cost of capital is 15%, and its cost of equity only is 17%. So remember when we calculated WACC, that is the average weighted cost of capital of all types of sources of capital or all elements of capital that we are using. So the WACC will be the weighted average cost of capital for the corporate bonds and the preference shares and equity, all three of those together will be the, the weighted average cost of capital. The 17% is the cost for equity only. The company is expected to issue three and a half million shares. So on this initial offering that we're doing, um, we'll, we will be issuing three, three and a half million shares to start with. We also need the information. We have determined that the company's current, which means this, this year, current free cash flow is 3.8 million. And this free cash flow is expected to grow at 7% for the next five years and thereafter, which means from year six onwards, it is then expected to grow at a constant rate of 4% per annum. So we've got an initial growth rate of 7% for five years and then a terminal growth rate of 4% per annum. So if you go and have a look at, um, I was actually just referring to this question before I came online with some other students. Um, question 5.6. Oh, 
Okay, if you go to page 130, or should I say section 5.6 in the textbook, <clears throat> it probably won't be page 130 because I've got an older textbook. Section 5.6 in the textbook, you'll see that is the free cash flow valuation model. If you look at 5.6.1, the heading is free cash flows. So this is what we're talking about here, the free cash flows. And example 5.4 shows us how we calculate the RAND value of free cash flows over uh, five years for a particular company. So when we use the terminology free cash flow, we are referring to a RAND value of, um, so from the profit that the company earned in that particular year, after deducting from that profit, the money that the company needs to cover any debt that they've got, plus the money that they want to put aside for investing in future assets, only what's left over of the profit is considered to be free cash flow. So example 5.4 is then showing you how we go about calculating this RAND value. In order to do this free cash flow valuation, when we now bring in, in that word uh, free cash flow valuation model, we require this free cash flow RAND value information as our basic data for doing the valuation calculation. So if you follow on in your textbooks, example 5.4 shows us how to calculate the actual RAND values of the free cash flows. Then page over and at section 5.6.3, that gives us the formula for the free cash flow valuation exercise. And example 5.6 and question 5.2 will then show you how to do the actual valuation exercise, which is what this question 4 is doing. So this question 4, you can refer to example 5.6 and question 5.2 in your textbooks. In your second task, you had a question similar to this, where they asked you to use the free cash flow valuation model to value, um, to calculate the RAND value or price that the shares should be sold at. So if you go back to your task two, you'll see you had a similar question to this as well. I'm just trying to give you a fix in the textbook and in the content on where to find the information for this question. So one interesting aspect here is that the free cash flow valuation formula is not on your formula sheet. So if you go and have a look at the formula um, in section 5.6.3, you'll see that it is quite a long, complicated formula and would be quite difficult to remember. So luckily for us, there is a formula on the formula sheet that we can use that is almost identical. And we're going to go to the formula sheet and we are going to use that formula um, let me just go up here so I can show you on the formula sheet. Okay, here. On your formula sheet, you've got this variable growth model formula. And you'll see that its structure, if you compare it to the textbook in your, um, to the formula in your textbook for free cash flow evaluation, you'll see the structure is identical. We have got an initial growth period where they give us a, um, the first growth percentage, so G1. And in our question, G1 would be 7% for the next five years. And then we calculate the present value of those first five years growing at 7% using this formula. And then we add to that the present value of 
this is not the in, yeah, at the end of, this is the terminal growth period with G2. So in our question, G2 would then be 4%. Okay, are you with me? You're going to use your variable growth model on the formula sheet, and you're going to substitute this if they ask for a free cash flow valuation. You'll see that it's just some of the variables that are um, that they that they use that are different. So in the variable growth model, above the the line over here. Sorry, I'm just looking at something here. Um, the section at the top here, DO uh, multiplied by 1 plus G1 to the T, we are going to substitute that. So this is basically calculating for the variable growth model. This is calculating the RAND value of uh, of D1. In other words, what is the RAND value of the next dividend? So in free cash flow, we don't have dividends as cash flows. We have free cash flows. So you would then use this 3.8 million as our initial cash flow at year zero. And then that would then grow at the rate of, what did we say, 7% for the first five years for n equals five. And then we would add to that here, this would be the free cash flow from year five. And we would then grow that by the second percentage. I'll try and write this out for you um, in, a, in a better, more meaningful way that I can post it for you guys to read instead of trying to explain on here. But just go and have a look. Compare this formula to the one in the textbook, and you'll see that you can substitute this formula for the free cash flow formula. So then you don't have to memorize that free cash flow formula. Okay, that's my main point that I want to make. I don't want to spend too much time um, going over that. But that is kind of like a cheat that you can use. Okay, so also you want to have a look at the layout of the answer for question 5.2 in the solutions, because that's the layout that you want to use when you do a question like this. So again, I'm not too sure what page number the solution would be in your textbooks, but on page 267 in my textbook, they have got the solution for question 5.2. And that gives us the layout that we want to use for this free cash flow valuation model. Okay, here we go. So this is what it's going to look like. Here we have got the initial five years of growth of our free cash flows. And we are going to grow them by that 7% each year and then present value them using the 17%, which is the, which is the cost of equity. Is that correct? Let me just double check that. Just hold on, I just want to check something. Sorry guys, I don't want to, no, I thought that's not right. Why this, um, this percentage here, must be the WACC percentage, which is 15%. I don't have a version of this memo where this has all been corrected, unfortunately. On my manual uh, printed copy that I use for marking, I have corrected this. So we'll just, as long as you understand, the most important thing is when we are using free cash flow valuation, we must use the weighted average cost of capital, the 15%, to present value the cash flows. The reason being is that these cash flows are the profit generated by all of the sources of the capital, not just by the equity only. 
and the valuation of the company that we arrive at using this method, this 34 million 094 here, is the total value of the entire company, which means the debt and the equity. When we do this, that 34 million is the value of the debt and the equity. So because it is the, the debt and the equity, we have to use the weighted average cost of capital for this present value calculation. So they gave us here that year zero, the current, take note the current, which means today, free cash flow is 3.8 million. So we want to know what that cash flow will be in year one, two, three, four, and five. So we take the 3.8, we increase it by 7%, so that in year one, in other words, the first year that we are forecasting, the cash flow is expect, free cash flow is expected to be 4066. Then we take the 4066 and we grow that by 7% to get year two's cash flow. And so on, we grow the grow it again by 7% to get year three, we grow it again by 7% to get year four, and then we grow it a last time, a fifth time, by the 7% to get year five's free cash flow. So we've got five years worth of free cash flow, having grown the cash flows at that initial rate of 7%. You look up the present value factors um, for 15% and one year and 15% and two years, etc., on your table. And this would be present value of a lump sum because this is an example of a mixed series of cash flows. So each one of these years is treated as an individual lump sum. So present value factor of a lump sum, you will look that factor up here and write it down multiply the cash flow by the present value factor, which will give you the present value um, of the cash flow for each of those years. We then add up these five amounts to get the in present value of the initial five years cash flow. So you'll recognize this from your bond valuation uh, formula and the layout of the bond valuation formula. This is identical layout and identical procedure that we do for that. So remember, the only difference in bond valuation is that instead of cash flow here, we are using the dividend from year one and we grow the dividends. Otherwise, it's identical. So that's five years at 7%. Then they said thereafter it will go at 4% uh, as the terminal rate. So exactly like we do for the bond valuation, we take the RAND value of the last year that we estimated here, we take that amount, we grow it by the terminal growth percentage, which is 4%, and then we take that over, um, this is R minus G, so the 17%, Sorry, guys, that must be 15% uh, again. I'm just reading off the paper. Let me just, it must be the WACC. So that must be 0 0.15, 0 0.15 minus the 0 0.04. And then also multiplied by the same present value factor that we used for that last year, year five, the 0.456. Calculate the present value of this stream of cash flows. And then we add the initial amount plus the terminal amount. We add those two together and we get the total value of the, of the estimated future free cash flows. So as I said, this total value is now we have valued the entire company, both the debt and the equity. So if you remember your accounting equation, we've got assets equals equity plus liabilities. So at this point, what we've basically calculated is the right-hand side of the accounting equation. This is debt plus equity. 
So we've calculated the total asset value of the company. We know that when we sell shares, the shareholders do not own all of the assets of the company because the debt holders, whoever has provided the long-term liability to the company, they own or own or they are owed that portion of the assets. So equity is only equal to equity meaning the value that is owned by the shareholders is equal to assets minus liabilities. So currently this value here of the 34 million is the total asset value. So we now need to do a calculation taking that total asset value and subtracting the value of all of the liabilities that the company holds. So if we go back to the question here, we'll see that um, the company currently has corporate bonds to the value of 16,150 and preference shares to the value of 9,750. So the bondholders are entitled to this value of the assets and the preference shareholders are entitled to this value of the assets. So we must take the total valuation and subtract the corporate bond value and the preference value and what's left over is then the ordinary shareholders equity value that they will own, the, the people who will be buying these shares, this is the value that will belong to them. They told us that we will be selling three and a half million shares. So we take the total equity value, we would divide it by three and a half million shares and this is how we arrive at the suggested initial list price of two rand 34 per share. Okay, so there's quite a couple of principles you've got to remember in this um, free cash flow valuation model. We discount the cash flows using the WACC percentage, not the equity percentage. Your format of your answer is going to look exactly like a bond valuation calculation. The only difference is that the cash flow that we are um, projecting forward is the free cash flow given and not the dividend RAND value. So remember, you can use your dividend valuation formula, um, the variable formula on your formula sheet to calculate this. And that when we arrive at this total value, which is the initial value plus a terminal value, we must not forget that we have to subtract from that total value any long-term debt that the company holds because only the balance belongs to the equity holders before we can divide that amount by the total number of shares to be issued to then arrive at the suggested initial list price. So you can see from this um, answer why we use this method when we need to calculate a share price where there is no share price that currently exists. This is the preferred method to use for that. And it does state that in your textbooks in this section, it does state that as well. Okay, any questions or observations on that calculation? Hopefully you guys followed what I was trying to say. Remember, it is in your textbooks. You've got the explanation, the full discussion. You've got the example. You've got the formula. And you've got a question in your textbook with the solution as well that you can work through. Okay. All good, Chris. That's good. So then let's go and have a look at the last question. So this last question is quite a long question. Um, Quite a long question. Um, okay, this last one for eight marks is a theory question, so I'm not going to go through that now because just for uh, purposes of time, but there were also eight marks of theory where they asked, explain the four main differences between the use of debt 
versus equity to finance a company. And I think in your textbooks, there is a table that explains that right at the beginning of the chapter. If you go to the beginning of chapter five, uh, right opposite the introduction, you'll see there is a table with five differences between debt versus equity. So that table is what you would have gone to for this particular question. It is a learning objective and that is a popular question, that, um, that particular table. So just bear that in mind. Okay, so then we can go and have a look at our question five. So we can see that this question five was worth 70 marks, which is a little bit scary when you look at that initially. But if you look at this question, you'll see that um, the question is always presented in its part. So there are various calculations that we've got to do that make up the full question and that will then give us our 70 marks. So let's just have a look at what the required is for this question five. So if we just read the first sentence, it says Klopp Limited is looking to increase its production capacity in order to meet the forecasted demand for its product. So therefore, they are wanting to buy a new machine. So we know where we're going for this. Okay, this is then going to be our capital budgeting application. Um, this is the information that we've got, additional information. So here's our required. We've got the first one for 29 marks and the second one for 41 marks. So two different tables, basically, that we're going to have to do. Well, there's more than one table. There's probably four tables. So, um, But in total, we are going to have to, for question 5.1, we must calculate the initial investment for the new machine. So in other words, the total RAND value of that initial investment. Um, and then we must calculate the working capital requirement for each of the years that we will be using this new machine. So that's basically two calculations, one table for the initial investment and a second table for calculating the working capital requirement for each of the years. And that's the 29 marks. Then for 41 marks, we have to calculate the income after tax for Klopp Limited. So this particular question wasn't very well worded and the students had to be given um, a little bit of extra information. Let me just see if I can find my version with the handwriting on it that will be clearer. So this full question here should read, calculate the income after tax for Clock Limited for new units only. In other words, we only want the income after tax generated by the new machine um, per annum over the life of the pro over the life of the project. So this this they really didn't give a full proper question in this paper. Okay, and you guys hopefully know by now with the capital budgeting applications where we calculate, um, we find it quickly, page 148. We are going to look at the relevant cash flow. So if you go to example 6.1 in your textbooks, that is where you find that whole discussion on the relevant cash flows. And then if you go to 6.6 .6 in your textbooks, you will see 6.6.1, the discussion and calculation for the initial investment. And immediately after that in the textbook, section 6.6.2 is the calculation for the operating cash flows which includes the calculation for the working capital requirements. If you turn over the page, you'll see that. And then we've got to calculate, uh, we've got to go to example 6.2, where we then have the full set of cash flows for the life of the machine, finally being able to calculate the total income after tax 
that's generated by the new machine. Okay, so that's where you'll find all that information in your textbooks. So let's go and have a look at the information that they've given us now that we know what to do. So that first question says, what is the initial investment? So quotes have been received, established that the cost of the machine would be four and a half million from its preferred supplier. That's the basic cost of the machine. Delivery costs expected to be 300,000. And import duties are expected to amount to 10% of the purchase cost. So all three of those costs would form part of the initial investment because they are all directly attributable costs to the initial cost of the machine. Remember also that we include in the initial cost of the machine any working capital that has to be utilized um, at time zero when we start using this machine as well. Information on the machine, it's got an annual production capacity of 80,000 units. We're going to use it for three years and at the end of the three years, it will be sold for its scrap value of 1750. We've got existing machines and they've got a capacity of 120,000 units. So only any excess over and above the 120,000 will be produced by the new machine. So in other words, the first 120,000 units we'll make on the existing machines. And only if our budget, production budget, exceeds 120,000 will we then use this new machine. And the new machine has got a maximum capacity of 80,000 units. Following demand and production of soccer balls over the next three years. Year one, we are going to use uh, sell or produce 195,000 units, then 205,000 units, and in year three, 220,000 units. I'm just looking for, okay, we'll come back to all of this. Let's go and have a look at this initial um, investment first. So remember in this required for this um, here, 5.1, they said calculate the initial investment for the new machine together with the working capital requirement. Because remember, I said to you, when we compile the initial investment, we must have include all of the directly attributable costs plus the initial year zero working capital requirement. So our initial investment is going to be the price of the new machine plus the delivery cost plus the import duties which was 10 percent of the initial of the original cost of the machine you are going to include a line here for working capital requirement and um, before you total that and then we're going to have to do a separate calculation for the working capital requirement here For the working capital, let's find that information. Um, where is this? We find it quickly. We have a current selling contribution variable cost, price inflation, fixed overheads, fixed overheads. Here we go, working capital. So here's our working capital paragraph. Oops. Manufacturing sale will give rise to additional working capital. Management has indicated based on historic trends of the company, the working capital requirement at the start of each year will equate to approximately, we will say will equate to 30% of the total variable costs linked to the production from the new machine only for that particular year. So what we're going to do for each of the three years, we have to calculate the total variable costs and then multiply those variable costs by 30% and that will give us the required working capital for each of those three years. Okay, does that make sense? 
working capital requirement at the start of each year will equate to approximately 30% of the total variable costs linked to production from the new machine only for that specific year. So let's go and have a look at our calculation. 195, 205 and 220, those were the gross amounts that they said we project in to sell each of the years. We must subtract from that amount the 120,000 units that are currently being made by the existing machines. So that leaves to be made by the new machine 75,000 units, 80,000 units and 80,000 units for the three years. Is my calculator. Gosh, you know, this is the, oh, there we go. Third time this afternoon I've lost my calculator. And why have we said 80,000 limit here? Um, in year one, 195 minus 120 equals 75,000. So we're good there. In year two, 205 minus 120 equals 85,000 units. So this calculation equals 85,000 units, but we are going to, we are limited to 80,000 units because that's the maximum capacity of the new machine. In year three, 220 minus 120 equals 100,000 units. So again, although the calculation equals 100,000 units, the units from the new machine, we are going to only make 80 because that's the maximum capacity. So that's the first little kind of trick that you've got to watch out for. Okay, make sure that you know what the maximum limit is of, of the new machine and you stick to that in terms of units produced for each of the years. Then we must calculate what are the variable costs for year one, two, and three. So we go back to our information here. And it says over here, variable cost is equal to 25% of the selling price. If the products were to be sold today, in other words, at time zero, the selling price would be 80 Rand per unit. Um, they gave us with the contribution ratio of 75%. So the contribution ratio means the contribution margin would be 75% of the selling price, which means that the variable cost is there for the other 25%. With our selling price, price inflation, so this is the selling price they're talking about, is expected to be 10% per annum for sales and is expected to be 5% per annum on variable costs. So today, time zero, our selling price is 80 Rand. The variable cost is 25% of that 80 Rand. But for year one, that 80 Rand must first be inflated by 10%. And then we can calculate the variable costs. So let's go and have a look at this calculation. We've got um, 80 Rand which is our initial selling price. Multiplied by 25% equals 20 Rand. So our current variable cost at time zero is 20 Rand. Inflation for variable costs for year one must be 5%. So variable costs in year one will be 21 Rand per unit. We then take that 21 Rand forward to year two and variable costs must grow by 5% for year two. And then the same thing for year three, take the variable costs forward to year three and grow the variable costs by 5% for year three. So we have then got total number of units for each year and the variable cost for each year. So we can multiply those out to get the total variable cost for each year. And we're going to multiply that by 30% to get the working capital requirement. So my working capital requirement for year one is 472,500, but they said that this would be required to be invested at the beginning of the year. So at time zero, this amount required for year one's working capital, the company would be required to invest that at time zero. So that then becomes 
the working capital that is added to our initial investment of the machine. So the directly attributable costs plus the initial working capital requirement at the beginning of year one. Then our um, working capital, total working capital required for year two is 529,200. So that means we need to invest an additional 56,700 at the beginning of year two. So that's why we are putting it under year one. Okay, so the, the growth 472,500 to 529,200 is an increase of 56,700. That must be invested at the beginning of year two. And then the same thing for year three, working capital grows again. So the growth in working capital from 529 to 555 must be invested at the beginning of year three. And then at the end of year three, the total working capital that was invested in this new machine is then released. So you'll see that the initial working capital and the two growths in the working capital all have brackets around them because those are cash flows out. And then when the working capital is released at the end of the project life, that is then a cash flow in. So that table needed to be compiled in order to calculate uh, the working capital for each year. And we needed that initial working capital for our initial investment. Okay, any questions on that? This was a, um, this particular question, you really had to read everything carefully. There were lots of um, initial prices and contribution ratios and different inflations for different aspects of what we were spending. You'll see also with the next table, fixed overheads increase at 6% per annum. Each year from year two onwards only, you really have to read carefully. And fixed overheads are 220 in year one. And then from year two, they must increase at 6%. Um, so we've got to take that into account as well. So then um, we're running out of time. So let's just quickly see. I want to just quickly show you what the workings look like for the second part of the question, which is calculate the income after tax for the company for those new units only. So here we go. We have got, again, remember the project is going to run over three years. Now, because they want um, income after tax, we want revenue minus costs minus tax equals income after tax. So we need the selling price per unit. So remember at time zero, the selling price was 80 Rand, but it must increase by 10% for year one. We then grow it by 10% again in year two, and then we grow it again by 10% for year three. That's our selling price per unit across the three years. We've already calculated our variable cost per unit in the table above for our working capital. So selling price minus variable cost equals our contribution per unit which is our relevant value that we're looking for. We also have already calculated the number of units to be produced by the new machine. So now we can take contribution multiplied by the number of units equals total contribution to be generated by the new machine across each of those three years. They told us that we've got fixed overheads of 220,000 in year one, and that they would then increase at 6% per annum from year two onwards. So here we are then subtracting from our total contribution, we are subtracting the 220,000 fixed overheads. We're growing it by 6% for year two and we're growing it by 6% for year three. That gets subtracted from the total contribution. And then the other thing that we are allowed to deduct before calculating um, tax is the capital allowance on the machine. 
that was given to us here. SARS currently permits a Section 12C capital allowance on the qualifying assets over a four-year period, 40, 20, 20, and 20. So we are going to, oopsie, we are going to take our um, cost of our new machine, which is the depreciable cost, will exclude the working capital requirement. Remember, the capitalized cost of the new machine will only be these directly attributable costs. The cost of the new machine, the delivery cost, and the import duties. That's what we will capitalize in our assets under machinery. Working capital requirement just forms part of the initial investment in the project, but is not part of the actual um, asset value of the, of the machine. So for our capital allowance calculation, we are taking those three costs and adding them together, and then taking 40% as the capital allowance in year one, 20% for year two, and 20% in year three. We are allowed to deduct those amounts also from the total contribution before arriving at total taxable income. So we can see here this calculation was total contribution minus fixed overheads minus the capital allowance. And then we did that for each of those three years. Then um, they asked us to calculate the income after tax. So this question also, there's a mistake on the memo I'm going to show you now. They did not ask us for the cash flow. They asked us for the income after tax for each year. So somewhere over here, they told us that, uh, where did they mention about the payment of the tax? Sorry, I'm trying to speed read quickly so I don't hold you guys up. Mm, I don't see it. Corporate. Oh, here we go, right in front of my eyes. Additional information. They pay the corporation tax one year in arrears. So that means if they had have asked us to give us the cash flow for the life of the project, we would then, the tax that we calculate for each year, we would then have put the tax for year one from, for cash flow purposes, we would have put it under the year two column and year three and year four, okay, for cash flow purposes. They did not ask us for cash flow here. They just asked for the income after tax. So this here is actually incorrect. Um, these amounts here where they've calculated taxable income times 28%, these amounts of the tax, must go under their own year, so under year one, two, and three. This must go under year one, this must go under year two, and that must go under year three, so that the income after tax is this taxable income minus the tax equals income after tax. Sorry, guys, that the memo is a little bit, it often happens, and I mean, these memos are not meant for students, they're meant for the markers, and quite often there are issues with the memos that we only pick up when we're all going through and marking the papers, and then we discuss it amongst ourselves and decide how we're going to adjust the memo. So um, just always remember, you must read the question carefully to make sure, again, that you have interpreted the question correctly and done exactly what the question has told you to do. And in that case, you will be safe. Like in this example, the developer of the paper um, didn't do the calculation that they asked for here. They actually did the cash flow adjustment at the end over here, which is not correct. So hopefully you've understood what I was talking about there. Sure, guys, we've just, just made it to the end of our hour. I didn't think I would finish that long question, but luckily we did. So um, hopefully, guys, that has helped you to 
get to grips with all the different kinds of questions that they could ask us in the exam. We've gone through loads and loads of questions this semester now. Hopefully it's been helpful. And guys, that is um, me, everything that I've got for you over and out for the semester. Obviously, if you guys still have got questions while you're busy revising, um, before you write, you're 100% encouraged to send me a message or an email to ask me for assistance. And you will be writing this exam on the 12th of November, which is just short of two weeks from today. Okay. Your exam according to the latest pairs that I've seen. And please, guys, triple check. Don't take my word for it. Exam will be on the 12th of November, which is just short of two weeks' time. So hopefully that is good. Okay, Chris, I'm holding for you this time. I'm sure you're going to be fine. Thanks, Melanie. It's a pleasure. I hope this has all been helpful for you. Um, and please, guys, remember, you are absolutely encouraged to ask me any questions while you guys are busy doing your revision. I'll also, you can send a message, but also once we start writing, I don't always go onto my um, learn that often. So there is my email address. So just take my email address down and then you're welcome to email me if you've got a question, because my email, I definitely do check that every day. Okay, so let me finish off the recording.